Good morning, everybody. I am Tom Vassell, and this is Board Game Breakfast. It's a show all about board games. Got lots of stuff for you. But before we jump into everything, this Board Game Breakfast was slightly delayed this morning. Lots and lots and lots of technical problems. But now it's out. I hope. I hope you're watching this, because this is like the 10th time I've recorded this. So, with that being said, yay, it's summer! Yay, school's starting up again! Yay, there's lots of things to talk about. I'll be back today around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have questions, I'll do a live Q&A then. But you know what? I'm tired of recording this particular clip over and over and over again, so let's just jump right to the news. Okay, so in the news, first of all, Renegade has announced passing through Petra. Actually, they announced this on our live show, but there's now pictures and stuff up online. This is a cool themed game. I like the idea of, of going to Petra. Um, J. Alex Kevern is the designer. He did World's Fair 1893, amongst other games. Um, and so I like this thing. I like that the board has this groove and you're you're trying to... I mean, it might be your typical Euro-style game. I don't know. But the initial theme and look of the game is cool. Quinid has announced Counterfeiters. This is a game about, well, counterfeiting. And anthropomorphic animals who live in Miami. Come on now. Um, are counterfeiting and the artwork looks like a lot of fun. But more importantly, from Quinid, they are reprinting, or they're going to be sending it to Kickstarter... Uh, Kickstarting second edition of Forenzy. This is a great tower building game. I actually have this one in my collection um, where you're building towers. It's a very simple mechanism with cards. They said that the new game's going to be language independent, um, but I'm very pumped to see this one come back. Target has announced 95 exclusive games. Well, I can believe that because I was at Target and saw many of these games on the shelves. Now, some of these exclusives were like exclusive for a week or exclusive for a weekend or what have you. Because some of them are available in other stores. Many of them are available on Amazon, so I'm not quite sure what that means. But I will say Target definitely has a big selection of games that you can go look at. Alright, so I, I talked a little bit about Fantasy Flight last time. Keyforge kind of sucked up all the news. But X-Wing, they did announce lots more stuff for X-Wing 2nd Edition, including two new factions, the Resistance and the First Order. Even if the Resistance faction symbol looks like identical to the Rebellion, but whatever. It's just so you can play the new Star Wars movies or the old ones. Um, Legion, Star Wars Legion, they announced Chewbacca and a bunch of Wookiees that you can play with. Huzzah! I mean, that's really true. I would love to have a huge army of Wookiees. Game Riot has announced this game goes to 11, which is not a Spinal Tap themed game. It's just basically based on that phrase. Fight Club, the home game from Mondo. They're making a lot of uh, IP style games, but there's some rule that they can't talk about this one. It's a two player deck building game in which you are Tyler versus uh, another his antagonist. Asmodee has bought, I know, that feels like that's the opening line to a lot of my news. Asmodee has bought Galapagos Holgos. I think that's how you pronounce it. They're a Brazilian distributor. I don't know what that one means. It's not like they got more games now. They're just like slowly snaking out their arms in all the different countries. This is another distribution house that they now control. And I mentioned this in my Kickstarter news, but I thought it's worth bringing forth. Uh, Brotherwise, who makes uh, Boss Dungeon, has a new game that they're kickstarting on Kickstarter. And one of the stretch goals, which they reached, was that they would be then next year, in 2019, be making a game based on the Stormlight Archive. Woo! Which is the greatest fantasy series ever written. Uh, I really like that series. I like the artwork. I don't like Boss Monster at all. So I'm hoping I like this game regardless. But yeah, it looks really neat. All right. Well, that is the regular news. Let's jump to Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. I am still recovering from Gen Con, but that can't hold up the crowdfunding roundup, right? So let's take a look at a few projects this week. The Sold Out Bargain Quest is back with a second edition and a new expansion. In Bargain Quest, players are fantasy shop owners working to equip heroes who go off to slay monsters. You'll draft item cards that you can display in your shop window to attract the kinds of heroes you want. But you have to be careful because display items cannot be sold, and you need to sell equipment to help the heroes, otherwise the undefeated monsters attack the town. 
The new Black Market expansion introduces new heroes, employees, and items, and an upgrade type. The talented siblings behind Bargain Quest have a ton of game design and art cred, and if you just need the new stuff, well, that takes a pledge of $30. But if you're new to Bargain Quest, you can get everything for a pledge of $70 plus shipping. Gray Fox Games is kickstarting Run, Fight, Die, Reloaded. This push-your-luck zombie game designed by Richard Launius includes 70 zombie minis and custom dice. Each roll, you'll be exploring the map, attacking zombies, trying to push the zombie horde back, and gathering equipment and supporters. And the zombies are just going to keep on coming unless you manage to escape town. Run, Fight, Die is a thematic cooperative dice rolling romp, and you can get a base copy for $49 plus shipping. Hellenica Story of Greece is an ambitious project from Mr. B Games. They're calling Hellenica a 3.5x game. Set in ancient Greece, players can build academies for scholars, research and discover new technologies, worship the gods and temples to gain favor so that you can call on them for aid later. And of course, you'll have to train your military for battle. Hellenica plays up to seven players at a time, and it includes an optional AI system that really allows you to play epic scale games with a smaller player count, including solo play. Hellenica features over 100 clever miniatures for the different building types, and there's an optional expansion for troop miniatures. But the base game of Hellenica takes a pledge of $90 plus shipping. One Night Ultimate Supervillains is the latest entry from Bezier Games into the One Night Ultimate series. The game continues the hidden role and social deduction fun of One Night Ultimate werewolf type games, but the Supervillains entry is especially well suited for new players or kids because of the heroes and villains theme. Each character has its own ability or action, even if it's being a bystander, that players will use and try to figure out who among them is on the villain side and who is on the hero side. And of course, the optional app features the dulcet tones of Eric Summer. And for all of you One Night Ultimate super fans, Bezier's created a collector's box that will hold all of the One Night goodness that you own. A copy of One Night Ultimate Super Villains, well, that takes a pledge of $25 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hey there, everyone. I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing the cubes with this week's segment from the page to the table. We are live at Gen Con, and I have one of my favorite gaming people with me today, and that is... My name is Christian Waters. I'm the marketing director for Osprey Games here in the U.S. Uh, Christian and I, over the couple of years that we've known each other, have built a relationship between Osprey and libraries, of which included you being a, a booth special guest at um, American Library. Library Association's annual conference this year. So I'd like for you to talk a little more about, on a publisher end, your relationship with libraries and how you feel publishers can have a symbiotic relationship. Well, to, to my mind, the Library Act is a sort of an advanced demo copy program. So if I give a, a, a library a copy of one of my games and people check it out and like it, they're probably going to go buy it because gamers are all, they're, they're all collectors, they're all building a stash, and if they like a game, you're going to want to have it on hand to play when you want. You're not going to want to wait to check out a library. Um, so to me, if I give a copy of a game to a library and somebody checks it out and goes and buys it, boom, with one. But also the librarians like Jen, like you, who are advocating for gaming in the libraries are very, very passionate. Or you, otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. And why, as a marketing person, would I not support that kind of passion and advocacy for gaming in general and my games in particular. I mean, it really is a win-win for me. Yeah, we've, we've been lucky to really kind of foster a relationship in, in terms of that. And I, I think we've talked a lot about return on investment. And I, I think what you have said, too, gamers are collectors. And I can't tell you the number of times, too, with some of the your earlier, the, the, like the war games, mm -hmm. too, I've had people so excited to see them at the library. They didn't know that they had been republished. Yeah. Um, and then just be like, I have to go out and get this now. This is so exciting. Um, I'm super happy to have you on today. Thanks for agreeing to do this. That's all for this week. Happy breakfast. Happy Gen Con. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. 
I'm Thomas Krogan. Kickstarters. <laughs> yeah. What do you look for in a Kickstarter? What determines whether you back a Kickstarter or not? Besides whether or not your significant other gives you permission to do so. Do you want Kickstarter exclusives? Do you want to get the game first before everybody else does? Or do you think that this is just a really cool game and you want to see it made? Something that happened at Gen Con. There was a Kickstarter that was successfully funded that is supposed to be delivered to the backers very soon. The publishers got some copies of the Kickstarter and asked the backers if it was okay for them to sell it at Gen Con. And they put a poll out where the vote was overwhelmingly like 84% or so in favor of yes, you can sell the game at Gen Con even though the backers haven't got their copy yet. Now, I've backed quite a few games, and this really surprised me because it seems like when the game starts to get delivered to people, guaranteed, the comment section is just inundated with people saying, How come I didn't get my copy yet? When you back a Kickstarter, what determines that, number one, that you just pull the trigger and back it, and number two, as a backer, what do you expect from that designer or publisher. Sound off in the comments down below. Tell me what you think. And if you want to follow me on any of the social media stuff, uh, all the pertinent informational links are found on the website. And until next time, thank you so much for watching. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to No Enemies Here Dice Tower Edition. Final Act is a two-player tank game excellent for beginners ages 10 and older. You command a platoon of seven tanks, and whoever makes it to the enemy zone first wins the game. You and your opponent simultaneously pre-program your tanks to move and when both of you are done, your tanks move to that program destination. To move you use a dial system which is super easy to use and very intuitive. The construction of this game is great, you get wooden pieces, wooden tanks and wooden terrain. This game teaches you basic concepts that every war game has, range, movement and line of sight. The expansion, which is sold separately, offers you more strategic choices. For example, airstrikes. You can move your tank two squares instead of one square. You can repair your tank. Final Act, a game designed by Sharon Katz, who was a tank commander in the Israeli army, and published by Taito Games. The next game I want to propose is Zulus on the Ramparts, a victory points game designed by Joseph Miranda. The art is by Tim Allen. This is a state of siege game where basically you're in the middle and everybody comes at you and you gotta defend yourself. What happens in this game is you're stationed in the middle and the Zulus come at you from four different angles through a chip draw system. So you pick up a chip and it says number one moves two spaces. The way you defend yourself is by drawing cards and on the cards you have different options by firing three spaces away depending how close the Zulu warrior is. Anytime any of the Zulu warriors get into your safe zone, you lose the game. You can defend yourself by having corporals or sergeants build a barricade. You can also build reserve platoons. You can have heroes with extra abilities. This game is not that easy to win because depending what chits you draw, what cards you draw, but it's a lot of fun. Zulus on the Rampart is a state of siege game. It's a solo game, plays about 35 to 40 minutes and is published by Victory Point Games. Thank you for watching, and if you're curious to know more about war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. All right, so what can you look forward to seeing from the Dice Tower this week? Well, you're going to see us review Hail Hydra, Hail Hydra, War Chest, Tower of Madness, Founders of Gloomhaven, Pantone, and many, many, many other games. You're also going to see a top 10 list for us. Top 10 games to take camping. And uh, we should have some... I know Sam is and Vernon are playing a game live this coming Thursday. We might do some other live things as the week goes by. Definitely I'll be doing, like I said, a 2 o'clock Q&A today. Trying to do more of that stuff as this month goes by. So lots of different videos for us. Also, we recorded a new podcast that's going up tomorrow. Our top 10 real-time games, which we recorded in real time um and so other things showed up in that that podcast and if you never heard it we have an audio podcast you really should take a listen to that and many other great audio podcasts all of which can be found at dicetowernetwork.com
everyone, my name is Annette and you may know me as Matters Plays and today on Applied Mechanics I'm going to go over Let's Make a Bus Route. So this is a flip and fill game unlike any other type out there and in this case there's a lot more player interaction because you're drawing on the same board. So let me show you a little bit about it and why I really like it. At the beginning of the game you'll deal out a player board to every player noting that they're all different from one another and you'll start every round by flipping over the bus stop card. Based on the color of the bus stop card, you'll look and see what type of route you can draw. So on the main player board, you'll be picking up different passengers by drawing these different lines or routes. You can pick up a certain number of tourists and you can drop them off at these different locations. You can also pick up commuters along the way and drop them off at stations. Every time you drop off these passengers, you'll make note of the number of points that you achieve at that time. For the students, you'll be picking them up throughout the game and taking them to different universities. At the end of the game, you'll multiply those two numbers and that'll be your result. You'll also pick up elderly passengers and if you ever want to change route, you may do so, but you'll get negative points. If you ever draw your route where there's already another route from another player, then you'll be gaining traffic. At the end of 12 rounds, you add up your scores from all different sections or subtract them and the person with the most points wins. So this might seem like another flip and fill game where you're flipping over a card and checking things off, but it's a little different than that. Simply because you have the main player area where all players are drawing on. So this creates a lot of player interaction because you're drawing these routes and completing tasks before other players along with drawing these routes and creating traffic. And a lot of people are just getting in your way along the game. And that's what makes this game so much fun. And that's why I like Let's Make a Bus Route. Well, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Flat hand syndrome affects five billion people every year. Simple tasks like making breakfast become impossible. Tying your shoes, horrible. They're so flat they get stuck on everything. Flat hand induced migraines. Trying to caress a loved one. You can still do it, but it's really weird. The only known causes of flat hand syndrome are freak tractor accidents, and it also tends to run in families. Well, all right, Stuart, it's about time we settle this deal with a handshake. Sounds good to me. <gasps> you have flat hands too? I know. If you know someone with flat hand syndrome, call this number today. Together, we can make the world a flatter place. Alright, this is Hoppler, where you have these weird creepy hands, you put them on these weird creepy sticks, and you get these weird creepy cones you put on here and launch into this stupid board. You're trying to get points, there's points right here in the board, first person to 100 points wins. And... So that was... Hoppler! Hot garbage! Hi, I was this skip First of all, this box is super creepy. Terrifying. And this game it. should so not exist, it's insane. It's not even a game, it's an activity. If you want to launch stuff into like different vessels, play Crazy Coconuts. Yeah. At least it's got better components than this. Yeah. This is something that's literally on sale at like World Market and it's just kind of been like, it's a stocking stuffer and I don't, yeah. I don't like fault things for being stocking stuffers. But people go to World Market to get things that cost too much money. Yeah. And maybe there's an opportunity to say, oh, by the way, board games exist. They're back and they're better than ever. Yeah. This is not the way to nope. spread that word. That sure ain't. It's weird. It, I don't like it. You can check us out at the Brothers Murph right here on YouTube. And we just did a Gen Con recap video. So we go did. check it out. Indeed. Until next time, we'll see you in mm. like Looney Tune Flathand World, <laughs> where we all want to live. See you there. Hey folks, I'm Jonathan from This Is Broken, and I'm back from Gen Con. Woohoo!
Oh yeah, I'm a little bit sad about that. But hey, c'est la vie. I was there for a full week. I was able to see some of you guys, hang out with the Dice Tower crew, go to the live show, play some games, buy some games. But now I have three announcements to do. As from now on, my segment's gonna be called Harsh Opinion. And secondly, I'm gonna talk about the same thing as I did before, but I'm, but I'm gonna include rule, rule book problems and graphic problems and all kind of stuff. And third, uh, today's segment is going to be all about you. Yes, I was able to see some of you guys at Gen Con and ask you the questions. What games do you like that you think that something inside is either broken, overpowered, underpowered, or not that answer at all? And here's the answer. Hi, this is Jenny Stevens. I go by That's What Jenny Said on War Game Geek. And I'm talking today a little bit about Stone Age, which has a mechanism that's very broken. It's called the Starvation Strategy. And in a nutshell, here's what you do. You don't feed your people, you let them starve. So while everyone else is wasting their time feeding their people, you're going to the breeding hut on every turn. This is an unbeatable strategy unless the other players collude together to take the breeding cut on every turn, and that's a little bit about Hi, I'm Alan. Um, my favorite game recently that came out is Everdell. It's a worker placement game, um, so make sure you go ahead and get uh, give them a like. But one of my favorite aspects of it is the card for the Rugwear. It's in the Collector's Edition, and it actually adds a little bit of take that. And so what you're going to do is you're going to play the card. It actually swaps the hand, so you play all your cards. You've got no cards left, and then you just straight up take your opponent's hand, and they can't do anything about it. Hi, uh, my name's Robbie. Uh, the game I'm talking about is uh, San Juan. It's a great light card game. A lot of people argue about which card is broken in it, though. I think it's the library. You get to do every privilege twice, so you get build out a discount of two, prospect for two cards. Everything you do on your turn is, is better, so and if you get it early on, you can kind of get to victory pretty fast. Hi, my name's Scott, and I'm doing this on behalf of my wife, who's not here right now, but she thinks the mechanic in Agricola that's broken is having to feed your workers. When you're, She loves worker placement, but when it comes down to feeding those workers, she's like, there's not enough time to feed your workers and do all this. You'll just never have enough time. You can't get all the points and you're going to lose points from that. It drives her crazy and it, she thinks it breaks the game. Thanks so much, Amy. Happy birthday. Love you and thanks for listening. Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. Each episode of By the Numbers, we take a look at a more game numeric related topic. This week's topic, does size matter when it comes to conventions? I put up a poll over on the Dice Tower Facebook group asking, what size of convention do you prefer? The choices range from your local game group or your family, all the way up to epic size conventions of over 25,000 people and the results are people tend to like the smaller but not too small local convention and the mid-size conventions the ones that range from a thousand to about 2,500 people sound familiar there might have been a bit of poll bias selection bias based on the fact that this is the Dice Tower Basecrit group and the Dice Tower Con falls in the most common choice. Maybe. I was surprised to see that the large giant conventions got about the same number of votes as your local game group or family. Who are going to these conventions? Maybe we're forced to go there to get all the new games, but we don't really like it. Maybe. So the largest convention I have attended falls on the scale somewhere around there. But hopefully if things work out later this year, I'll be attending PAX Unplugged, which last year had about 45,000 turnstiles, 30,000 or so unique attendees. So it'll fall in the highest category, and it'll be by far the biggest convention I have gone to. I'm pretty excited. Hopefully I'll see you there. Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. I'm just indulging in one of my favorite post-convention activities, reading the many rule books I got from the games I picked up there. It got me to thinking, I almost never 
learn a game at the table by reading the rule book. One of my favorite things to do when I get games is to open up the box and start reading the rule book, knowing that it's going to be a little while before I get a chance to play it. I tend to read the rule book, let it sit with me for a while, ruminate on it, let it rattle around in my brain a little bit. I might even go back and read the rule book before I ever play the game. And it just got me thinking. I wonder if that's something that is normal or abnormal? Is it something that a lot of people do? Do you tend to read your rule books before you play the game or do you learn it at the table, crack open the box, read the rule book and play it right there? The few times that I've done that, I've found that I feel a little bit anxious that I'm going to miss a rule, that I maybe am not going to understand one of the key aspects of the game. And so I really enjoy taking the time to read the rule book and just kind of luxuriously go through it and see what it reminds me of. What, what is this, uh, what game have I played that's like this? Or what is unique about this game that I may need to remember to teach other players? So I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Do you tend to read the rule books before and take some time to let them sink in? Or do you just open it up at the table, read the rule book there and, and start going? If you can let me know in the comments below, I'd be really appreciative. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. Happy breakfast, everyone. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about Elder Sign. Now, this is actually a game that's new on my shelf, but I've played it for a long time. It's a cooperative dice roller, if you don't know, for one to eight players. Now, I wouldn't ever go up to that upper limit, or most likely ever play it solo, but those options are very much available to you. As you go, you do sort of a rounded three stages. You move to an adventure, you try and do the adventure by rolling the dice and matching symbols to tasks, and then the clock moves. Every time it strikes midnight, something bad normally happens, unless you can kind of do the caveat on the card that comes up. Eventually, you'll either have collected enough items of, or elder signs to be able to stop the Ancient One from destroying the world. If that's not the case, and the Doom track is full up, then it awakes and you're probably going to get kind of devoured, gobbled up, and the world's doomed. The Elder Sign is the same universe as Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror, so it's definitely got the lore in bags. But it doesn't always come across from Elder Sign, and the main problem from that is I find the text you kind of ignore. The artwork is really small because it's all focused around those dice. But I'd still maybe have liked more room for highlighting that text, showing those images, so you can really sort of go, this is what this adventure is for, what I'm doing, rather than just it being, I need a skull and a scroll and then some magnifying glasses to complete it. I don't know. I know you have to keep the two things separate of theme and presentation, but it really would have helped drive it. Anyway, that's Elder Sign. Despite that issue, I love the game. Anyway, I'm Oliver East, signing out. Oh, colours. I love bright colours. I have it in my games behind me, and games are swaths of colours. In fact, there are games now made about colour. But I want to talk briefly about player colour. Now, this is not necessarily a rant against companies needing to make their games colorblind friendly. Although you should do that. I know it's not always possible and it can be very difficult, but I don't think we should automatically say, hey, here's a game, red, green, blue, yellow. Those are the four automatic colors. First of all, not everyone wants to play red, green, blue, yellow. I like when there's alternate colors to games. But pick what you want, but that colorblindness is something to keep in mind. But not just colorblindness, low lighting. There's a lot of games where the blue and the purple or the pink and the red or whatever the colors are. You, when you're playing a game, if you don't have like beautiful studio lighting, you're sitting there going, wait, what color is that again? And the colors of the game, and this is my pet pet peeve, should not be the same colors as stuff in the game. Like Ticket to Ride was the first example of this that I remember where the colors were there and then the trains were there. And so I was yellow and there was yellow trains and I play red and there's red trains. And I, every game I have to say, I know you're yellow. See those yellow trains? They're not yours. Those yellow spaces on the board, not yours. But that could have been easily picked by giving a player's pink and purple and white and then making the tickets yellow, red, and what have you. 
So that's something I think to think about. Or if you, there's a yellow player, but there's also a pile of gold coins that are yellow and they're like little round yellow discs. And you're like, well, what? those aren't your pieces. You don't own gold. That's just a confusing thing. Now, I also am not a big fan of when colors are, hey, we got brown and we got light brown and dark brown and tan and dark tan and white and off white. What? Then there's garish colors where they're all different colors in rainbow, although that doesn't bother me nearly as much, although I suspect it might bother some people. I just want my color to be able to look at the board and be able to distinctly know what the board is. If the board is all blue, I don't want to be blue. You shouldn't even have that as a player color. You know, and if there's spots on the board where my colors will get lost in, I don't want that. So I think player color is more important than people are talking about. This is something that, that should be, this is a big thing. Not really, but it's something I've been thinking about and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on player colors. What's your favorite player color? Mine's purple, then black, then white. Uh, what's your least favorite color? Mine is brown, then light brown, then tan, then, then puke green, then uh, brown again, and then uh, tan. Oh, did I already say tan? Okay, back to brown. You know, anyway, let me know what you think in the comments. Until next time, I'm Tom. Well, wait, there's more, there's more of the show. Sorry, let's keep going. What's up, everyone? I'm Danny. And I'm Derek. And this is You, you Bet, Bet Your Bippy. In this segment, we're going to give you some fun facts about a specific game so you can strike up a conversation at your next game night. And this week's game is... Doo -doo -doo -doo. Forbidden Sky. <laughs> Forbidden Sky is a cooperative action selection game in which players are laying down tiles as well as necessary components such as capacitors, lightning rods, and a launch pad to create a true electrical circuit. However, they must be careful, otherwise they'll be struck by lightning. Hey Derek. Hey. Did you know that lightning is a very, very common occurrence and there's actually 100 strikes of lightning every second? Every second? Every second. So it does mean that lightning strikes every time Rihanna moves. You bet your bippy. <laughs> hey Danny. Yeah. Did you know that astrophobia is the fear of thunder and lightning? Oh really? You bet your bippy. It's third only to the fear of heights and the fear of animals. The fear of animals? I know. I couldn't be afraid of Bowser. <laughs> Not a little puppy. Well, did you know that in your lifetime, you only have a one in 600,000 chance of getting struck by lightning? That's a relief, really? Yeah, but one man by the name of Roy Sullivan, who is a park ranger in Virginia, got struck seven times. Seven. And survived all seven times. And survived, guys. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, that is absolutely crazy because did you know that one single bolt of lightning can um, reach temperatures up to 36,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Wow. It is crazy. Fastest way to fry chicken. That's right. Or just, you know, your average one o'clock day here in Florida. <laughs> So did you know any of these fun facts about lightning storms? Or do you have any of your own that you'd like to share with us? Please do so in the comments below. Make sure you guys check us out all over social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And we'll see you next time. Happy breakfast, everybody. Happy breakfast. Welcome to The Pitch. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Lusa, and we are in Orléans, the Place du Ma Trois, very close to a board gaming store uh, where Ilka told me that I have a blank check to find a fun, dumb summer game. Here we are, it, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but here we are in Bella Ciao in Orléans. I think we entered the tiniest board game store in the world. Let me show you. But you can stand here, I that's can stand. amazing. I'm the perfect size. I have this much above my head. Yeah. And I'm really short. <laughs> <laughs> but there are loads of games here. They're awesome. piled up right here everywhere. There's one chair. I'm sitting in it. And if you're not sitting in the chair, <laughs> you yeah, don't have any short. room to, to move at all. But we are even on the second floor of the Bella Chat. Look down here, more games. Remember Dave? Dumb, fun summer game. Oh, rise to nobility! No. no. If there's no one around to play with, how about some Sherlock Holmes consulting detective? Um, excuse me, sir? Yes, sir. Um, this game, is it just in French? I, I fell for it before that people tell me something is just in French and in the end it wasn't. 
Is this just in French, of the French version? Yeah, this is just in French. And this is the one I chose. But there's no language on the cards, just pictures, so you can play it in any language. Smart. Right? That's me, the smart one. Uh, you are in Bella Ciao, in Orléans, uh, in the middle of France, south of Paris. Hi, I'm Hugh Mello. And I'm Gabby. And this is Time to Play. And what did we play? We played Mysterium. Mm, so what's Mysterium about? Mysterium is about a ghost who's trying to get these tourists to find out who the murderer Well, actually, they're not tourists. They are investigators. Like, they're uh, clairvoyant, like people who can have some, some kind of power. And including power of deduction, so they need to figure out who committed the murder. How did you do in the game? Well, the first time we played today, we got, we almost got it. We had one card wrong. Yeah. But this game is impossible for our family to win. She likes to be the ghost. She kind of dressed up and put all the. Things. You didn't have your cape today, you had a blanket, so it was yeah. strange. Uh, she does a very good ghost. She go into character, sometimes she will paint herself and everything. Uh, do you like this better than Dixie? Yes. Yeah. Yes. To me, this is like Dixie for purpose, isn't it? Like, you're actually playing something. Yes. But we I... do like Dixie as well. Yeah, we do like Dixie. Dixie was actually one of the first four games that I learned. That is true, yeah. One of the modern ones, at least, yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think about Mysterio? Is that the two thumbs up game? Two thumbs up. All right. Uh, two thumbs up for me as well. Let's do our two thumbs up. I like that. We did that last week. So, two thumbs up. And uh, it's a game that is very family oriented, so it's worth to take it. Well, thanks everybody for watching and happy breakfast, everybody. Happy breakfast. Your turn. Ooh. I'm ready. I'm Alan. Welcome to Games Just Played. Today we're talking about role player. We've been waiting for a long time to pick this one up. Um, we finally did at Miniature Market on the way home from vacation. We played it last night for the first time. I liked it a lot. Um, I know we say we like games a lot, but yeah. we usually only pick games that we know we're going to like. So you're not going to see us talking about many games we don't right, like. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we played this one at two players. Um, I, I know there's a lot of similarities to, to Sagrada, but I didn't have any interest in Sagrada yeah, me at either. all. It didn't really appeal to me very it much. It looks pretty. I like that it looks yeah. I appreciate I always appreciate that. Y'all know that. <laughs> but um, this one just, I don't know, caught my eye. Yeah, it, it was really nice. I like the, you know, you can do a lot of dice manipulation and moving mm, around. That was cool. Um, and then the character traits where you're trying to do the your alignments and all that. Uh, just a lot of little um, things that work really well yeah. together. I feel like you have to pay attention for every turn. Um, in a lot of other games, you can kind of have a cruddy turn and be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll fix it next time. This one, you really got to pay attention to where you're putting those bad yeah. boys down because yeah. really, I got screwed over a couple times. <laughs> right. And picking the proper dice, not picking dice that are too low, um, depending on what you're going for. I know there's a lot of cards in there that uh, you can kind of, do like a dump row yeah. where it's like you know if your numbers are this and lower you get this amount of points yeah. um, but really being conscious of where you put that initial die because yeah. uh, you really only have so much you can do with the manipulation yeah. i'm anxious to try it with more than two players i think it played awesome at two and i don't really see the game changing a ton i mean this is just the base we don't have the expansion so that said i don't feel the game would change a ton with multiple players um it'd be a lot more um, circulation through the market yeah, row, so true. maybe you know more people taking your sets of armor. Yeah. I could see that happening. That's um, true. But. I made big bank on that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the chain mail. Big bank. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, we love it. Good review again, guys. <laughs> and our picture of the day you'll see in a second. Yeah. Have a good week, guys. Bye. Hey guys, and welcome to Tantrum House HQ. I'm Will Meadows. And I'm Sarah Meadows. And today on The Throwdown, we've got The Mind from Pandasaurus Games in the red corner. And The Game from Pandasaurus in the blue corner. 
Mind is an intense, quiet, internally torturous card game for two to four players and is fun for the whole family. In the Mind, players are trying to lay all of their cards in ascending order from 1 to 100. Each round, players are dealt a number of cards based on which round they are in, and then without talking to each other, they have to try and lay their cards in order. Players do have a couple of shurikens at their disposal that they can use to discard their lowest card with. If players are able to sink their minds and play all of their cards in order and make it through all of the levels, they win. The game is for 1 to 5 players and has players trying to lay all of their cards in order from 1 to 100 as well, but this time they have four different stacks to work with, two of them ascending and two descending. Each turn, players have to decide which stack would be best for them to lay a card on. In this game, if a card is exactly 10 greater or less than the card on the table, the player can actually help pull the deck back a little by playing a card that would normally be out of order. Players may play as many cards from their hand as they wish each turn and then draw up. If all the players are able to empty their hands and not be stuck with any cards that don't fit, they win the game. All right, so we're looking at two different cooperative card games where you're just trying to get rid of all your cards in order to win the game. Which one do you enjoy more? I actually enjoy the mind more. It's more of an experience. Nobody has turns, and you just play when you think that your card comes up next. Uh, so I think there's a lot of tension, and uh, it's just more an enjoyable experience for me. Yeah, the game definitely involves more strategy, like when can I play my card? Should I hold on to this? Because I might be able to play three in a row and backtrack it, which is a really satisfying feeling in the game. Uh, it is a little bit more cooperative. Like You feel like you're kind of working together with your team. Uh, in the mind, it's just kind of like, I don't know, I'm going to it. So uh, let us know which one you guys enjoy more. Uh, they are both available at your local friendly game store, so check them out and then give us some comments because we'd love to hear back from you. And that's it for another board game breakfast. Woo! All right. Well, we'll be back next time. I hope you enjoyed this. Check out all the rest of our videos that come out this week. Every week we do a companion to board game breakfast called Week in Review, which is going to be posted slightly later today, but it's coming. And that we go back over all the videos we did last week. It's kind of a short summary, so check that out each week. I also do a video each Wednesday. You can check the one I did last Wednesday out called um, Look Back, where I take a look at reviews we did a week, five, I mean a year, five years, and ten years ago, kind of to see where I, what I think about those games today. Well, with that being said, that's the end for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.